Hello. Welcome to the Maryland Bankruptcy Center website, which is owned and operated by the law offices of David L. Rubin. I am David L. Rubin. And today's video, what we're going to do is we're going to take the paperwork that we've put on the website that the client is required to fill out in order to file bankruptcy, and I'm going to go over that paperwork with you and try to do my best to explain how everything is filled out and make this process as easy as possible. The first three pages of this packet, I'll call it the packet, is an explanation of how bankruptcy works. Now, when you first call my office, I'm going to explain to you everything about bankruptcy. Of course, if you're already on the website, you see that there's a lot of helpful information on the website to teach you about bankruptcy, Chapter 7, Chapter 13. But the first three pages here also gives you a step-by-step -step analysis of from the first visit to our office to the final discharge. What I want to explain to you is that is this. This is a tool for you, this video, to ex help you explain how to do this. But if you have any questions, as you know, you can always email our office, you can always call our office, you can speak with me or one of our associates anytime, and we will help you through these questions. This, this video here is just to make this a little bit easier for you because sometimes people are intimidated by the process. It's about 30 pages. It looks like it could be very difficult and time consuming. We know you're going through a very difficult time as it is having to deal with this bankruptcy situation. So I'm going to break it down and show you that it really is an easy process and we're going to help you with it and we're, we're there to help you with it the whole way. The most important part is providing the documentation that we need in order to file bankruptcy. Now we're only asking you for this documentation not because we want to but because the court requires it. In order to get the benefit of eliminating your debts or stopping a foreclosure or whatever it is you're doing in Chapter 7 or Chapter 13, you have to provide documentation to back up the information. This is a list that we've got here on the fourth page to explain to you what you need. And the first three items are the most important and everything else is required as well. Most importantly, you've got to provide us income tax returns. The last two years that you have filed, full state and federal income tax returns. If you have not filed your income taxes yet, or if you have not filed at all, that's okay. We just have to talk about that and figure out why. If you can't find your income tax returns, let us know. There is a way to get those through the IRS by faxing something over there, but it takes about 10 days, and it sometimes can be a little bit difficult. So to the extent that you can find your income taxes for the last two years that you filed them, we need those. The bankruptcy court requires it. They won't accept your case without them. Secondly, and just as important, your pay stubs. You have to, whether you're doing a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 13, you have to prove what your income is over the past six months. We will have already talked about that when we've determined whether or not you're eligible to file Chapter 7 or Chapter 13. But in order to back that up, we're required when we file the papers with the court to provide proof of income to the trustees. What the court requires and what we require, therefore, is six months of pay stubs. What does that mean? Well, if, you have your, if you've kept them at home, great, you copy them, you bring them in with you, or bring them in and we'll copy them for you. If you don't have them, you call your employer and say, hey, I need my pay stubs. They'll give them to you. I haven't had a situation where an employer, a current employer, hasn't just been able to go on the internet, print them out, and give them to you. If you are married, even if you're filing bankruptcy individually, you have to have your spouse's pay information as well. Biggest question asked all the time from spouses. Well, if I provide my pay information, does that mean I'm affected by the bankruptcy? Is it going to ruin my credit? Why am I being brought into this? I'm not the one with debt. And the answer is because the law says, hey, if you're married, we have to look at household family income to determine whether or not you're eligible to file bankruptcy. So we have to prove what it is that your household makes. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. If you're separated, not living together with your spouse, you don't have to provide your spouse's information. If you are living together, you have to do that. If your spouse is unemployed, fine, there's nothing to provide. If your spouse has disability payments, show us proof of income or that disability or something like that. Proof of income is imperative to going forward with the bankruptcy. We can't file it for you without it. Some people say, hey, what if I am paid under the table? I don't have proof of income. That's fine. If you don't have proof of income, you don't have it. But when you fill out the rest of this paperwork for us, you have to tell us how much you mo money you make and how much, you know, what your income is and, and where you earn your income. It's just what you have to do. So if you don't have the actual proof, 
that's fine. You have to just list it. You have to do everything you can to get this information. Sometimes people come in and they say, hey, I used to work at this company three months ago and they're not talking to me anymore. I can't get that information. Fine, just let us know and we'll take care of it for you. There's always a solution. There's, none of this is gonna prevent you from filing bankruptcy unless we tell you. So if you have a question, if you run into a roadblock, don't worry about it. Just call me or email me and I'll answer the question. I've been doing this for 23 years. I've answered all the questions already. Rarely is there a unique situation. So just feel free to answer questions. That's what we're there for. Third, bank statements. Very important, I just need two months of bank statements. Whatever bank statements your name is on. So if you're on an individual bank account, I need that. If you're on it with your spouse, I need that. Again, it's not affecting your spouse, but I need that. If your spouse has a bank account, don't need it. A lot of times what people forget is they're, they have a bank account and they're on it with their parent or something like that, just, just for purposes of being on there, just in case they can access money. If that's the case, you have to tell us about it, and we need that information. It probably won't affect anything, but we need that information. So any accounts that you're on, I need that bank account statement for the last two months. Fourth, and again, one, two, and three, by far the most important documents. The rest, I need it. Do everything you can do to get it for me, but if you can't find it, we'll deal with it. Most recent bills from each of your creditors, number four. If you have all your recent bills, give me a copy of them. If you don't, not the end of the world. We're going to get a credit report for you in every case. We're going to get all three credit reports, and we're going to find most of your bills. But sometimes there's bills that aren't on your credit report, and you may know who it is that you owe the money to. You may owe money to a, a gym membership that we don't know about. You may owe money to a, a friend, um, an old employer or something like that. If you want that debt included in your bankruptcy, you've got to tell us who that is. So even if you don't have a document, in here, and I'll go over this with you in a minute, you're gonna say who it is, what their address is, and approximately how much you owe, and we'll be able to take care of it. But know that all we can do is get your credit report and get the information that you provide us. We don't have investigative powers to go out and find out who it is that you owe money to. So do the best you can at providing us the people that you owe the money to. Copies of titles to vehicle, if you have a vehicle, whether you're going, planning on keeping that vehicle or not, if you have a copy of the title, Bring that in to me, I'll make a copy, give it right back to you. If you're separated from a spouse and you have an agreement where it sets out child support or alimony or something like that, bring me a copy of the agreement. Most recent 401k, pension plan, retirement plan, as I'll explain to you when you come in, that's called exempt property, which means you can keep it, but we still need to see a copy of that statement. So if you don't, if you don't have one, See if you can ask your employer to get one. Usually they send them out once every four months or three months, something like that find a statement. If you can't find it, not the end of the world. We'll do the best we can with it, but do your best. If you own a home, again, whether or not you're letting your home go into the bankruptcy, whether you're trying to keep your home, whether there's a foreclosure, we want to try to find out what the value of that home is. There's a website called Zillow.com that we use, and actually the courts use sometimes too. It's not always accurate, but it's the best we have. You go online, Z-I-L-L-O-W.com, you print out how much the house is worth, and you bring that to us. If you can't do that, we'll do that for you. Not a big deal. Any collection notices you've received from any companies over the years, bring those notices to me. The reason why that's important is because those people need to get notice that you're filing bankruptcy. If they don't know, they're still going to contact you. And if they don't find out during the bankruptcy proceeding, you might get a lawsuit in the mail two years from now that says, hey, you owe us money. You have already filed bankruptcy and taken care of that debt, but they won't know, and it makes it for a difficult situation. So the goal here is to provide us as much information and documentation as possible. We don't mind bringing you coming into our office with a big box of paperwork. That's fine. That's what you pay us for. That's our job. We'll go through that paperwork. And, then, and finally, the same thing, any lawsuits, any court papers that you've received, you've got to bring those to me. And if you lost them, at least let me know that you did get court papers and we'll look on the computer and do the best to find it. On to the next page. It's called Credit Counseling and Debtor Education. And we will have explained this to you when you come in over the phone. It's on the website. In 2005, when the bankruptcy laws were changed, what Congress did was they required, they made this requirement to say everybody that files bankruptcy has to do what's called pre-filing credit counseling and post-filing debtor education. It's an online tutorial. Some people get nervous. They say, I don't want to have to go to classes. When are they? Are they in the evening? Uh, is it expensive? What if I fail? What if I pay? 
It's not like that. It's very, very simple. It's a tutorial. If you're good with the computer, you go online. It's cheaper that way. We suggest some alternatives of websites that take care of this for you, but we're not in any way affiliated with anybody. You can Google pre-filing credit counseling Maryland. A bunch of them will come up. Find the cheapest one or whatever looks easiest for you. You go on there, you give them some information, you answer a whole bunch of questions, and at the end, and I'm told it takes about 45 minutes to an hour, they give you a certificate saying that you completed it. The cheapest one we could find is about 10 bucks. Um, the prices are going up here and there, so I don't know if at the time you're watching this video it's still $10, but um, the price is about $10 to do this, and then you do that before you file bankruptcy. You have to get it done. Not the first time you come in. You don't have to get it done when you see us, but before we can actually file with the bankruptcy court, that has to be done. It's very easy. Once it's done, they actually send me an email letting me know that you've done it, and then we print out the certificate, and then we file it with the court with you. So your only job is to go on, pay the 10 bucks, and answer a bunch of questions. It's really, really easy. The rest of the client questionnaire is really the easy part. It's just filling in the blanks. It's like you're going uh, to, to buy a house or to buy a car or filling out papers at a doctor's office or something like that. It's simply filling in the blanks. I'm going to go over it with you quickly, give you some, some idea of why you're doing it. But I'm going to go over the overall picture of why you're doing this in the first place. Some people say, well, I don't want to have to do any work. I don't want to have to fill out any paperwork. Why can't you do this for me? The way it works in bankruptcy and the way things changed a little bit in 2005 is the judges said, we want the, the debtor, the person who's filing bankruptcy, they need to give their information. They actually need to write it down so that the lawyer then takes the information, puts it into a petition which the debtor signs, but that information is coming from the debtor, the person who's filing bankruptcy, not the lawyer. They don't want us doing, putting things in your mouth, making up information for you, helping you sue or say things you're not supposed to say. It needs to come from you. So this packet here is designed to make it as easy as possible to answer all the questions that are required by law to answer, and then we take that information, we submit it. Bottom line is this. The only thing you have to worry about doing is being truthful. There are a lot of pages, there's a lot of information. All the bankruptcy court wants to see, and the bankruptcy trustee, and I'll, I'll teach you about that if you have questions, all they want to make sure is that you're being truthful and as accurate as possible. So don't worry about writing the wrong thing, don't worry about leaving something blank. If you have a question, we'll answer that question, we'll help you out. But the bottom line is this. If you're not truthful, if you're lying, if you're admitting information, your bankruptcy is not going to work. And I don't think that's happened in our firm for years and years because we make sure that when people come in, they understand this process is this. Look, the federal government passed laws to help people get rid of their debt. All they ask is to be truthful and to qualify. And I'll let you know whether you're, you qualify, and in all likelihood you do. Um, all you got to be is truthful and provide the documentation and everything will go smoothly. So when you fill this out, do the best you can, be accurate. First page, client questionnaire, name, address, make sure that if you've had names in the past, maiden names, whatever names, you fill those out. Social security number, it's important that you provide your social security number and you provide it accurately. When we actually file the papers with the court, we don't file that electronically so that there's no chance of, of people picking up your social security number that's being filed online. But you've got to give it to me in the paperwork that you give to me and we'll take care of it for you. Date of birth. The next questions are how long have you lived in the state of Maryland? That's important for bankruptcy laws. You have to live in the state of Maryland or have property here when you file. But depending on how long you've been here depends on certain laws that we use in determining what property you can or can't keep. Don't worry, you're going to be able to keep all your property, otherwise we're not going to file it. But we need to know how long you've been here. That's why there's questions. Have you been here for the last six months? Have you been here for the last two years? You need to be accurate. You need to give us that information. It's important, but it's not going to prevent you from being able to file bankruptcy. It asks you the information for your spouse. If it's a joint filing, obviously we need both information, uh, both names and everything. If it's not a joint filing, we don't need your spouse's name. Remember, we do need your spouse's income information, but that's it. Don't need your spouse's Social Security number. It asks you if you've ever filed bankruptcy before. This is important. Obviously, for a Chapter 7, you're only allowed to file once every eight years. For a Chapter 13, it depends on the circumstances. We ask here, have you filed bankruptcy in the last eight years? 
If you have, you have to let us know. If you're not sure whether it was eight years ago or seven years ago or nine years ago, that's fine. Ask us. We have access to the system where we can put in your name and we can find out exactly when it was filed. And we may, you know, depending on when it was, but you've got to tell us that information because if you don't, we're not going to know. We're going to file the papers for you and the, the, the computer system's going to come back and say, hey, this person already filed and that's not a good situation. You don't want that to happen. So if you have filed bankruptcy before, let us know and do the best you can and tell us when it was. You have to tell us your marital status. You have to tell us whether you're filing individually or jointly. You have to tell us who lives in your household. That's very important when it comes to Chapter 7 and whether or not you pass what we call the means test. And again, I will probably have already spoken to you about that. But based on how much money you earn and how many people live in your household is determines whether or not you can file a Chapter 7 or if you have to file a Chapter 13. We always prefer doing Chapter 7s because it's cheaper, it's easier, it's quicker gets rid of all your debt. But if you make too much money, you have to do a Chapter 13, which is more of a payment plan kind of thing. But it depends on how many people live in your household. If you have minor children, that's obvious, write them there, down. But even if you have people who live in your household that may be over the age of 18, but you're supporting, perhaps a grandchild, perhaps a, a younger brother or sister, perhaps a parent that you're supporting, whether or not you're claiming that person on taxes or not, you write that person's name. We need to know that because it could be very important to your case. We ask you for the income for the past six months. Do the best you can with this, but if you provide me the pay stubs that I need, which shows exactly what you've been making over the last six months, you don't have to fill this out. But if you get Social Security or you have a part-time job or there's other sources of income, you've got to let me know what kind of income you have. The next page is real estate. If you don't own any real property, just write none. Try not to leave anything blank because then I won't know that you looked at it. But if you, so if you don't, so write none or not applicable, whatever, whatever's easier. If you are on a deed that is not your home, well, it's your home, but it's on your parents' home. A lot of times people put their name on their parents' home or a spouse's or, or a significant other's home or something like that. You've got to tell us that information. Even though you may not be the true owner because it's not yours and you're not living there. In other words, it might be a home in Florida where your parents are living, but your name's on the title. You have to give us that information and that might affect your situation. Otherwise, if it's your house, you've just got to give me the information. Tell me who's on the deed, you, you and your spouse, you and whoever else. Tell me the address of the real estate. Tell me who the mortgage company is. Give me the address of the mortgage company, if you have it. Um, and tell me the information that it says on here. And again, it says, what is the value of the home? Remember, we're going to go to Zillow.com and figure out how much the value is. If you think that value is not accurate, tell me why. Sometimes it's way off. Sometimes you, don't, you have no idea what the value is. Sometimes you know what the value is, but the computer doesn't because you know what condition the house is in. Do the best you can, and we'll go over that together because that's very important. And here in the end, do you want to keep this real estate? If you're going to let it go, let us know. If there's a foreclosure pending, let us know. If you want to keep it, that's fine. Remember, in Chapter 7, you're still allowed to keep your home as long as you're current on your mortgage and there's not a lot of equity in your home. Again, we'll talk about that and what equity means and how much you're allowed to keep. But just fill out all this information for me. And that means all houses. If you own a rental property that you're renting out, you've got to give me that information. If you have a home equity line of credit, if you have a second mortgage, you've got to give me that information. I can't know everything. We don't do the investigation to determine everything that you have, not only in Maryland, but in any other state. You've got to provide me with that information. The next page asks about lawsuits. If somebody's suing you and you've received court papers, give me that information here. If you own a timeshare, tell me about that timeshare. Personal property. This, is, this causes people uh, stress, and I don't want it to cause stress. So I want to explain to you how to go about filling this out. You are allowed to keep property in Chapter 7 bankruptcy, and you're allowed to keep all of your property in Chapter 13. In Chapter 7, you're allowed to keep a certain amount, depending on the situation, depending on whether you're married or not. For your purposes, you just have to fill these things in. If it says savings account, you need to tell me the savings account. You need to tell me the bank account. If you have the account number, great. And you've got to tell me how much is in that account on the day you fill out this paperwork. We're going to get that updated when we file the papers with the court, but you need to give me this information. You can't just give me a number. You've got to tell me what bank it's in. Checking account, savings account. If you have more than one checking account, you've got to give me those. If your name is on a checking account or a savings account, 
of an elderly parent or something like that, just so that your name's on there, you have to provide me with that information. You can't forget about it because that could come back and bite you in the end. So that's very important to fill this out as best you can. Cash on hand, if you have cash on hand, if you have a couple hundred dollars in your wallet, fill it out. If you don't have anything on you, if you've got 20 bucks, fill that out. Just be accurate. That's all we ask. Truthful and accurate. Do you have any interest in a life insurance policy? If you do, try to let me know whether it's a term policy or a whole life policy. If you have questions about that, just ask me. Not a problem. Do you own any annuities? If you don't know what that is, that's fine. If you do have an annuity, write it down there and tell me about it. If you have a question, I'll answer your questions. Do you have a 401k or a pension plan, IRA? If you do, like I said earlier, you can keep the whole thing. Nobody's taking it from you. Just because you write something down on this piece of paper doesn't mean you're losing it. It doesn't work that way. You're not at risk. We'll tell you what you're at risk for. You have, still have to give me that information. Do you own any government or corporate bonds? Most people don't, but if you do, let me know. Does anybody owe you any money? The purpose of this property list, and a big purpose of what this bankruptcy is all about, is to see if you've got money coming your way so that the bankruptcy court can use to pay off your debts. In other words, there's questions here. Do you have a car accident case pending where you're receiving a big settlement in the next couple months or the next year or so? If you do, that could be an issue. What they don't want people doing is saying, oh, I'm gonna inherit money in two weeks. I just won the lottery and I'm gonna collect in a month. So I'm gonna file bankruptcy now and not let them know. You can't do that. So what you're doing here by answering all these questions is you're swearing under oath that you're being truthful, that you don't have a lot of money coming your way. Bankruptcy is for people not who are necessarily poor, not who are people who don't earn money and, and work, it is. It's for people who are in a situation where they don't have the ability to liquidate their assets. They don't have the ability or funds coming their way to pay all their debts. They're in a tough spot and they need to get out of that spot and that's what bankruptcy allows them to do. So that's what these questions are geared toward. You have to be honest and truthful. If you don't list that you have a big medical malpractice claim where you're gonna receive a million dollars in six months and it turns out that they find out about it, that's bad. We don't want that to happen. I don't, can't remember the last time it has happened or if it's ever happened. But that's why these questions are important. And it's important for you to pay attention to these questions. So just read over them carefully, answer them, and if you have a question, call or email. I can't stress that enough. Finally, your household inventory. Some people look at this and say, what? How can I possibly put an inventory or tell you how much the things in my house are worth? I don't want you spending more than 10 minutes on this little grid. It's required, you have to do it. Don't leave it blank. A lot of people come and say, I don't have anything, so I'm not writing anything. Well, everybody has something. You have clothing, you have a cell phone, you have a TV set probably. If that's all you have, that's fine. You write it down, you tell me how much you think it's worth. How much is it worth? Well, it's not what you paid for it, it's what you could get for it at a yard sale. How do you know the answer? You don't know the answer, you guess. So don't stress about it. Don't look on the computer to find out what a used Sony 25-inch TV would sell for. If it's a TV that you bought for a couple hundred bucks and you've had it for a couple years, maybe somebody will buy it for you for 20 bucks. If you have a whole bunch of clothing and it's old stuff, I don't know, maybe you could sell it all at a yard sale for $150. You'll know, if you have jewelry that's worth a lot of money, well, then you have to list it and be honest about it. If you have property that you, know, you just purchased that's worth a lot of money, you have to list it. By filling this out and being accurate, you're telling the bankruptcy court, I don't have a lot of stuff and that's why I need to file bankruptcy. They're not going to take anything from you that they don't think they can sell and make a lot of money. And again, I don't know the last time I can remember a case where the trustee's actually taken property. If you come in and you've got four or five cars worth $10,000 each, well that's a problem. We're not going to file the bankruptcy because they're going to take them from you. Fill this out, take more than, no more than 10 minutes. Do the best you can, answer the questions. If you have questions, let us know. Tell us about your cars. People always keep their cars when they file bankruptcy. If you owe money on your car, tell me who you owe, how many miles are on your car so that we can look it up on the computer and figure out how much your car is worth, how much approximately you owe on the car. Let us know whether you want to keep it or not keep it. For those cars that you may have that are paid off, give us that information. You do have to try to get the car titles for those vehicles as well. If you can't find them, 
you go to the MVA and get a duplicate copy because at some point you're going to have to get one anyway. You might as well use this opportunity to do it. If you have three cars, write down the three cars. If your name is on a car that you perhaps co-signed but also owned with your son who's off at college, even if you're not driving it, you still have to put that on there. You're not going to lose it. You just have to write that information. More is better. Less is not as good. If you have a, a boat, tell us about the boat. If you have a trailer, tell us about the trailer. The next section is unsecured creditors. Now, that's generally the reason why people are filing bankruptcy, Chapter 7, is because they have a lot of credit cards, your classic unsecured creditor, medical bill, uh, repossessed vehicle, bill from a debt collector. Do the best you can and tell us who it is that you owe money to. Like I told you earlier, the only thing I can do is get your credit report and find out who you owe money to, but everybody you owe money to may not be on your credit report. A doctor may not report it to your credit reporting agency. In which case, if you don't list that doctor, I don't know that you went to that doctor. You need to do the best you can. I'm not concerned with how much you owe. Just give me an estimate because those numbers change every day. And frankly, it doesn't matter how much you owe. The debt is going to be discharged as long as you list it on the paperwork. People say, well, what happens if I forget? What happens if there was somebody five years ago when I lived in Texas and I didn't list it? The answer is that debt will likely be discharged as well as long as you're not intentionally forgetting. Do the best you can. It'll be a pain in the neck later on because they won't know, but all the debts that you have will be discharged in bankruptcy. All we can ask you to do is say, hey, you want this thing to go smooth? You want it to go quick? You want your discharge quickly? Move on, rebuild your credit. The more information you give us, the easier it'll be. So we provide you with a lot of paperwork for that. If you run out of room, go ahead and write on the back, write more paperwork, whatever you want to do, it's fine. The next page is self-employed business owners. If you're self-employed, or if your spouse is self-employed, you have to fill out six of these. We need six months of income to determine whether or not you can do a seven or a 13. We need six of these for the last six months. So when you're doing it, if you're filling this out in July, I need you to fill it out for January, February, March, April, May, June. Tell me the gross income for the month and tell me what your monthly expenses are. We need to know that information. Do the best you can and make sure that it matches up with your bank statements. When people are self-employed, that's always a red flag for the trustees. They look at self-employed people a lot more carefully because self-employed people don't always keep their records straight. They don't always file accurate taxes. If that's not a problem, that's not a problem. You've got to give us that information, so, however. If you haven't kept records, recreate the records as best you can. If you can't do that, then you might not be able to file because you have to provide accurate and truthful information. So if you're not keeping good records, if you're not filing proper taxes, you're not going to get the benefit of the bankruptcy laws. Do the best you can. The next statement is the monthly budget. We set it out here for you. Tell me what your mortgage payment is. Tell me what your rent payment is if it's rent. Fill out all these things as accurately as possible. Does it have to be to the penny? No. My BG&E bill, I don't know, sometimes it's 300, sometimes it's 400, sometimes it's 200. Okay, so the average is $300 a month. Just be accurate and truthful. If you want to go back over the last 12 months and add them up and divide by 12, that's fine too. Clothing, I don't know, what do you spend for clothing? Depends on how many kids you have. Depends on perhaps what kind of job you have. Gasoline for your car, same thing. Gas prices may be high at some point, and they might be low at some point. You have to give me estimates. And the point here, and this is really important for bankruptcy, is to show at the end of the month, you don't have a lot of money left over or you don't have any money left over. That's why you're filing bankruptcy. So if you fill out a monthly budget and you lowball everything and you say, I've got $1,000 of monthly expenses, but I'm bringing home $3,000, you can't file bankruptcy because you can afford to pay your bills. Fill this out as accurately as possible. A lot of times people come in, they fill it out, and I say, that can't be true. It's got to be higher than that, or it's got to be lower than that, or that's unreasonable. That's fine. Just do the best you can and fill it out. What's going to happen is, with our firm, you're going to fill this information. We're going to take it, we're going to do all your paperwork, and then we're going to sit down and go over it with you. And if we have questions about it, we're going to ask you those questions. You're going to say, yeah, that's truthful, and then you're going to sign off on it. This is important, though, the monthly budget. Make sure you fill it out. The rest is it's called Statement of Financial Affairs. It asks you a whole bunch of questions that, where you just have to say yes or no. All we can tell you is be truthful. Again, have you ever filed bankruptcy before? Sometimes we get repetitive. That's okay. That's what the bankruptcy court makes us to do. Makes us do. Have you lived in any other state in the last two years? These are a lot of questions people forget to 
answer or we just we want to make sure we get everything right. Read these questions, answer every one. If you don't understand it, email or call, ask when you come in. We're always here to answer any questions. That's all the paperwork that you have to fill out. The only other part of the packet that you're going to have is called the United States Bankruptcy Court Notice to Consumer Debtors under 342B of the Bankruptcy Code. What is that? Well, we're required to put this in here by the Bankruptcy Court and by the Bankruptcy Code. And I, you need to read it because it's basically telling you what I've already told you. You need to be truthful on your paperwork. And it's explaining to you that if you're not truthful and somebody finds out that you're lying or you're omitting something seriously on purpose, then you're in trouble. So when you're filing your bankruptcy papers and signing everything, when, we're, when we get to that stage, you're saying, yes, I, I, I am truthful and I've, I understand all the notices. We give you a notice on here and what we say is notice regarding bank accounts. Um, this is important. If you have a bank account, for example, with Wells Fargo and you have a credit card with Wells Fargo, we're going to tell you that the best thing to do is to move banks. Um, that's not doing anything fraudulent or illegal. You're simply taking your money out of one bank and putting it into another because if you owe the bank where you're banking money and we file bankruptcy, they could take that money from you and you don't want that to happen. So we put that in here in a notice and let you know. And then the last uh, piece of paper we have in here is what's called a bankruptcy services agreement, which is the agreement that you and I will eventually reach. I'll put in here how much we're charging you. Uh, you'll review this, you'll sign it, I'll sign it, and we'll have an agreement. You're agreeing to pay me for my services. I'm agreeing to make sure that we do everything right and we discharge your debt. So thank you for taking the time to watch the video. Uh, remember, we're here for you, for your bankruptcy needs. My name is David Rubin from the Law Offices of David L. Rubin.